Uh, we have Ramesh Ramadure, Chairman uh, CIA Karnataka, joined us just now. Uh, uh, hello, Ramesh. Welcome to the session. Yeah, hello, and thank you very much. Good. With that, we are just starting for our a good afternoon, a wonderful after, wonderful Wednesday midweek afternoon, I would say, right? Uh, good afternoon to everybody who has joined us. I'm Sajna Shankaran. I'm the convener of leadership track of Ivin Karnataka chapter. Indian Women Network was launched in the year 2013 in Karnataka with the clear vision of advancing the equity of women by enabling and empowering professional growth. Since April 2021, I would say like four months back, Ivan Karnataka saw a strategic shift, keeping membership engagement at the core of everything. A strategic shift to be on a continual improvement journey of empowering individuals, transforming organization, impacting society, building a community and de developing self with a common purpose of impacting lives, livelihood and growth through SDG 3, 5 and 8 partnership. Today, it actually gives me immense pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of Ivin Karnataka to this wonderful session. I'm here today with two emotions, you know, one is a passion, another is an enthusiasm, a passion towards what we are going to craft today, an enthusiasm of probably a college girl who 20 years before, now don't go on guessing my age, 20 years before used to sit in a classroom, listening to her professors with that eagerness, right? For her, the professors or the teachers were the role models or inspiration. And I can vouch on behalf of everybody today that, you know, for all of us, our first inspiration, our first role models were our teachers, our professors. They were the guiding light for us and it still continues to, right? I don't think anybody is there in this meeting who cannot close their eyes and has a nice memorable moment or an interaction with their professors or teachers, right? And what more can we ask this in afternoon? Look at the list of speakers that we have. We, can, we, we are going to have a lot of fond memories to, from today. Let's look around, right? The world is changing. I would say we are evolving and education sector is no exception to this. So today's panel discussions, which is centered around the theme education redesigned, aims to discuss and deliberate with the thought leaders and the industry experts on the future of the education system, the current challenges that has been posed and how the education is aimed to plan and collaborate with the key stakeholders towards a sustainable progress or growth. So looking forward for our eminent speakers and the panel discussion. With this, let me in invite Ramesh Ramadurai, Chairman CII Karnataka, Managing Director 3M India to speak about creating a culture of inclusivity. I'll take one moment extra to speak about Ramesh Ramadurai. He is the pillar of support for each and every member of Ivin Karnataka. He's always a call away and is a source of constant encouragement for us. His support and wisdom has always let us strive for excellence. Welcome Ramesh to the session and it's our privilege today to listen to you. Thank you so much for your very generous uh, introduction and welcome, Sajna. And good afternoon to everyone. So I'm just going to make, uh, you know, one of those, I guess, uh, apology, which is, seems pretty commonplace these days uh, due to some video connectivity issues. I'm calling in through my cell phone. So I'm going to keep my video off. You know, I'm here. It's not a bot or anything that's, uh, you know, speaking on my behalf. It is me behind the camera, behind the phone here. So with your indulgence, I'll turn off my video just to make sure this thing doesn't trip during the course of the next few minutes. Okay, so once again, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. You know, in CII, I, you know, in my role as CII chairman for Karnataka for this year, <clears throat> as we interact with our member companies, one of the topics that comes up frequently is increased engagement with academia and educational institutions. So I thank Ivan for organizing this very important discussion on education. I welcome our group of speakers, panelists, and moderators who are all eminent practitioners, thinkers, and leaders in this space. You know, to that extent, I almost feel like an interloper to be here in your August midst, but I will try and do my best with your indulgence once again. I will make a few remarks on inclusivity and end this with a call to action. As you all know, Sustainable Development Goal SDG 4 delves into quality education. You know, the targets 4.1 to 4.7 covers a broad range of outcomes we have to deliver with equitable access for boys and girls to primary, secondary, technical, and vocational skills. Bridging the digital divide is another important aspect. 
This will help us bring into the mainstream a diverse pipeline of talent who will then have the opportunity to actively participate in and contribute to shaping the institutions, society, and markets of the future. We are also familiar with the concepts of diversity and inclusion. You know, at a basic level, diversity is the demographics of who we are, such as gender, people with disabilities, underrepresented groups, minorities, and more. But for such diverse people to thrive, we know that a culture of inclusion is absolutely critical. A culture where one feels psychologically safe, where the option of keeping quiet does not seem like a safer alternative to speaking up and more. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are extremely crucial in education to fully harness the potential of our so-called demographic dividend, to understand whose voices are not being heard, to identify dominant or dogmatic views that may need disrupting, and also to inculcate scientific temper and rigor. So how do we do this? If I could tell you this in the next couple of minutes that I have left, it would have been done a long time ago. This is a complex topic, but there are some fundamental tenets. And here I will take the liberty of sharing some ideas from our own company. You know, at 3M, allyship is very important. An ally is not a noun, it's not treated as a noun, but as a verb, which requires us to take intentional action. We recently launched the REAL, that is as an acronym, R-E-A-L, as an acronym. We recently launched the REAL allyship model where each one of us individually can make a difference. So what is real? So R is reflect. That means consider your own personal experiences and background. E is to empathize, seek to understand the experience of others. A is to act, advocate for, and L is to learn, embrace continued growth, such as the one I just spoke like this, which is relevant for their ecosystem. Educational institutions are best place to create theirs. Educational institutions are driven by a strong purpose. And that purpose manifests itself in many ways beyond delivering academic excellence. It may include outreach to underserved sections of society, financially weaker students of the student population, promote student resource networks, which can help them overcome their own recognized and unconscious or subconscious challenges and many more such issues. Therefore, here's my call to action. I urge educational institutions to elevate the importance and visibility of diversity, equity and inclusion practices. Just as you have a dean, you know, you have a dean or a chairperson for academic affairs, for faculty affairs, for alumni relations, to promote diversity, equity, and in the spotlight. Develop your own roadmap through informed debate, sharing of ideas with other institutions, and make this an important pillar of your esteemed institutions. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to share a few ideas here with you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ramesh. And you know, the best part about it was that, you know, I have never looked at allyship as a verb. And now it's moving from an intention to action. It means a lot, right? So while we have a call of action to the educational institutions where they're going to make the diversity and inclusion as one of the pillar, I think all of us are going to take back that call of action where we are going to change allyship to a verb where our intentions would be converted to actions go forward. Thank you so much, Ramesh. It was a really insightful few moments with you, but it was really, really insightful. Thank you so much once again. Uh, with this, I have two uh, eminent personalities to be welcome to the session. So let me start with uh, Nantini Sarkar, our chairwoman for Ivan Karnataka to the session. And she's also the global equity, diversity, and inclusion leader. Nantini, welcome, leader at Boeing India. Nantini, welcome to the session. I must say that your passion to the excellence and never give up attitude has been a differentiator for Ivan Karnataka chapter. I've been associated with you through Ivan Karnataka chapter for the last two years, and it has been really, really a wonderful time and a lot of learning experience. Welcome, Nantini, to the session. Next in line is Anupama V, who's the vice chairwoman for 
Ivan Karnataka and a managing partner for AVRC Legal, a great mentor and a guide for Ivan members. And uh, every interactions with her has been insightful. Her patience, her calmness to handle any critical situations has been really, really commendable. Uh, Anupama, I take this opportunity to welcome you also to the session. And without both of you and both of your guidance, I'm sure the session would not have been happening in the shape and form it is happening today. Thank you so much and welcome both of you to the session. With this, let me take a pause and welcome Deepa Gangadharan, who is a member of IWIN Leadership Task Force to set the tone for today's event. Deepa, over to you. Thank you, Sajna. So first of all, very warm welcome to every one of you who's here in this panel discussion. And uh, thank you to Mr. Ramesh Ramadurai for sharing his insights about I know the call of action especially because it is very important to have inclusivity and diversity and starting from young age uh, at our education uh, you know, level, that brings a lot of value add in our future generation and how we can shape our country uh, you know, uh, as, as responsible citizens. So, so talking about CII, Ivan, so um, in 2013, the Confederation of Indian uh, you know, Network launched the Indian Women Network, which is Ivan, with a vision of being the greatest network for career women. With more and more women joining the workforce, it became imperative for, for a networking platform to be in place so that like-minded career women could come together, share their experiences, and learn from each other. So, as part of the leadership uh, you know, uh, pillar of IWIN, we work towards ensuring women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership at all levels and uh, all levels of decision-making in political, economic, and public life. So having said that, with a lot of these changes around, COVID has brought about a lot of change in the world and navigating through this changing world is our very own education sector. So, but are these changes enough? Carl Rogers, the famous psychologist had said that the only person who's educated is the one who has learned how to learn and change. So we have learned that our classrooms must change, but our prime focus should be in building a culture of creating, of creation in our young minds. So this panel discussion is doing just that. It is aimed at supporting innovative educators, ensure that every student progress with passion and skills to be a productive, successful, and responsible citizen. So how do we make our students more accountable and responsible? Let's find out. So over to Sajana, who would be introducing us to the wonderful panelists of Education Redesigned. Thank you so much, Deepa. I think you have set the platform so perfect. Moving on, let me take the privilege to invite the chief guest for today, Dr. Bhimaraya Maitri, who's the director of IM Nagpur. Dr. Maitri has served as the director of IM Trichy before joining IM Nagpur. Dr. Maitri has curved a reputation for himself with his rich experience in teaching, research, and administration with a number of national and international institutions of note. We welcome you, sir, to the to this discussion to take us through our journey towards excellence. Dr. Maitri, for you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, CI Karnataka and all the, the chairman and all the esteemed distinguished members of the CI Karnataka and distinguished participants. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, to just begin with, you know, all of you know that today we are in the fluid world. Future is fluid. Leadership is fluid. Everything else is changing. Earlier world was hookah and probably more appropriate today is a fluid world. So old is not dead and new is not started. We are always in a transition stage. So that is where the excellence is going to be a very, very challenging in coming years. Because earlier days, if anything new comes, in, in course of time, learning curve and experience and expertise, we used to develop the experience, uh, you know, the excellence. But today, the moment you get into that, something else will come, it will, everything will change. And that is how, you know, all the skilled jobs and repetitive jobs are now being taken by the robots. And people, every time there is skill, upskill and learn, new learn and unlearn. This is a continuous phenomena. So in such a circumstance, such a situation, such a context, Excellence is going to make a difference, but how to get into excellence is going to be the challenge. 
so that is why journey towards excellence what i'm thinking is we are already moved from industry era to intelligence era so industry era is everything is visible you can see assembly line people and working everything but in intelligence era it is like a electricity you can't see but you can get the best result so in this kind of context i can see three important pillars for journey towards excellence one for education institutions in this fluid world in this disruptive world uh, uh, you know the, the every time new contexts are coming it is like a flowing water now the, the education or every sector of the business is moving like a flowing water every time everything is changing and you can't touch the same water uh, in in a second minute so in such kind of context i can see three important things one is three important parameter for journey towards excellence one is look within number two look around number three look beyond so you have to adopt three strategies to get into journey of excellence look within look around look beyond now what you have to look within within look within i i just find the five terms in each one of them in look within as a education institution we should look at the curriculum not only the curriculum which is the age old it is a kaizen we have to get into a kaizen journey in a curriculum continuously you have to align our curriculum equip our students what corporate world wants so it is a continuous revision of curriculum gone are the days for 5 year 10 year 2 year we have revised so every semester we have to revise the curriculum align what is in the corporate world that should be there in the academic hall number 1 number 2 we have to basically look into the pedagogy the way you used to teach you know gone are the days of ppts you know power corrupts and powerpoints corrupts most now the time has come a phenomena based learning phenomena based learning means basically people students should be get into given a situation given a pandemic is a situation given a flood is a situation or merger and acquisition is a situation in the corporate such projects are given to the students and faculty member from different functional areas right from strategy marketing operation information systems obhr and law all will be coming and guiding the students and they will going through this phenomena this context and instead of you know in a education institution there are four important components from 3 to 4 earlier knowledge the attitude that is a being part and the third one is a competency now fourth one is added that is capability so competency alone is not good enough even though skills are changing and new skills are coming but capability means it is a development of mindset development of skill alone is not sufficient in in future along with the development of skill development of mindset is also important if you develop the mindset those students are going to lead the unborn roles in unknown companies are unknown roles in unborn companies so that is where these four competencies one can build with with the changing the pedagogy into project based learning or phenomena based learning that is what i call it as a, a, a new pedagogy is emerging similarly assessment probably we have to put the students into the gamification simulations you need not to conduct the examination paper and pen examination you just observe the 10 round 20 rounds of the games you can see how courageously they play how what kind of tenacity they exhibit what kind of curiosity they exhibit what kind of risk they take how they sharpen their decision making skill after the first round second round faculty member can observe and they can be declared as a excellent good fair and poor so those kind of assessment should come and today we are we are in the stone age you know scoring system which is not going to assess all these skills which are required in today as well as tomorrow so that is the second part third one is a multidisciplinary basically new education policy talks about a center of excellence you know cross functional teams working together multi minds are better than any one of us and different perspective or magic of perspective will come into picture and students will develop their mindset that capability will come into picture that is how it is important to get into the centers of excellence and multidisciplinary and the last one is digital design and digital offering you know this is the digital disruptive world we should be the first one to take 
you know, capture the technology, put into the education system as a digital university or institute and offer the, uh, you know, digital learning to the students along with the time we also have to continuously change. These are the five things within. Then what we have to look around, what are the five things we have to look around to achieve the excellence? Number one, look around means we have to get into collaboration. Collaboration, particularly education institution, they look towards the industry, industry institute collaboration. Probably today, industry institute, uh, the connection is students graduate from the institute and they join the industry. Now I'm thinking why can't students join the industry because they want to do the education from so and so and institution. You have to change the game. Now, uh, probably, you know, in a year or two, I am going to bring a game changer at IIM Nagpur. Students will join the best of the best company because they will get the education from best of the best institution. So that the kind of collaboration you have to build with the industry. Number two, cooperation. So second look around cooperation means academic banking of credits. You know, we have to collaborate with Co uh, different universities and institutions. Students can study at Delhi, Calcutta, Bangalore, Mumbai, Pune, and their credit can be transferred and banked. And also multiple entry and multiple exit. They, you can have co cooperation with the industry. Students can spend a term or a year. They can get a diploma again after two years, come back, get a uh, degree. You know, like that, one has to get into cooperation. Third one is a partnership. It is extremely important global exposure, cross-cultural understanding, international partnership is going to play an important role. So, so that international partnership is going to give a larger exposure and working in the MNC, you also get into different cultures and you understand and that is going to play an important role for the excellence. And the last one is basically it is about the consultancy. Fourth one is a consultancy. We have to thickly involved in the industry consultancy. So to what we learn from consultancy, we have to put back to the classrooms, academic halls. And similarly, another important look around is industry research projects, which is one of the lagging thing in India. We have to get into industry research projects. So these are the five pillars around we can look into that to achieve the excellence. The last, what we have to look beyond. So look beyond means probably look within and look around, then look beyond is something breakthrough. You have to benchmark your education institution best of the best in the world. Understand what they are doing and what we are doing and how to close the gap. So we have to get into benchmarking. Number two and most important for Karnataka CII, which is, you know, I think whatever I listened few minutes back, you know, it, it, it is going to be very, very, you know, gender focused and a lot of promotions for the women in the CII and in, in, the, in the particular activities. So another important look beyond what I'm bringing is a gender diversity. To achieve the excellence, gender diversity is going to play a very, very important role. I have observed two studies, one from the BCG and another one from the McKinsey. McKinsey 2020 says, if you have basically, if you, if you involve the gender diversity team in your education, in your organization, it demonstrated the improvement in profitability of 25% in corporate world. That is the study of McKinsey. Similarly, study of BCG, Boston Consulting Group 2020 says, if you have a gender diverse team in your organization, then around 40% increase in the innovation revenue. So you can imagine innovation, revenue, and profitability in the corporate world. They succeeded just having the gender diversity. I'm sure in education institution also, multi minds are better than any one of us. And that is where the diversity and within that also, the, the gender diversity is going to bring the excellence. And also a lot of you know institution can move to the new orbit. This is the second pillar under the beyond. Third pillar is innovation and adaptation. The mantra for success in future is the innovation and adaptation. Continuous adaptation and continuous innovation is the journey if you want to achieve the success. So uh, you, you can't give a full stop. Number four, joint, it is outsourcing. Basically, some portion you may not be having expertise. 
somebody is good in the family business somebody is good in entrepreneurs you can have collaboration with those institutions and you can have arrangement with dual degree or joint degree one degree of india one degree of you know wharton business school so one degree of indian one degree of maybe some of the uk warwick business school for manufacturing one can have a dual degree kind of arrangements so that is you have to you may not be having the expertise but you can collaborate with them so that is the outsourcing or joint and dual degree that is another one we can think out of the box the fifth and the most important one is international accreditation hallmark ex hallmark of excellence come from accreditation so these are the uh, you know within india we have national accreditation board of accreditation and nac in bangalore is headquartered in nac similarly international accreditation so that we can standardize our education as a best of the best so if you take care look within look around and look beyond and these five parameters each in each one of them probably we can get into a journey of trip as ramaji came out with real i think i must also talk about trip t r i p so always we are on the trip particularly corporate people t stands for trust if there is a trust means boss is a trustworthy the the people working with the boss they will take a risk a director or vice chancellor is a trustworthy many faculty member and staff take a higher risk and the moment they take a higher risk they get into innovation and adaptation the moment they get into innovation and adaptation then the p will come into picture that is what p stands for p stands for programming execution so t stands for trust r stands for risk i stands for innovation p stands for programming that is nothing but execution execution bring the success real success come from execution so if you get into a trip strategy i am sure we are exactly on the path of excellence journey so with this once again i thank uh, cii for inviting me for this particular very very important subject uh you know education redesigned i am sure this is a continuous journey and uh, the excellence is the only way we can stand up in the crowd and we can make india as a vishu guru with this once again thank the cii karnataka and i wish all the best for this webinar thank you very much thank you so much dr maitri uh, one thing that i'm never going to forget from your speech right power corrupts and power powerpoint corrupts more okay so i'm just going to that's engraved in my memory forever but how how you you made this a journey of excellence look so simple and nice right we just have a three step model look within look around and look beyond and and i must say if you are able to if every one of us is able to do that not only in the education sector i think everywhere there is that is the journey of excellence and now you have to just pull, fit it into different domain that we are working in look within look around and look beyond and it was so beautifully put across thank you so much for your time so today and it was wonderful listening to you thank you namaskar moving on we have our guest of honor professor gk nayak who is the vice chancellor for garden city university to speak about future ready institution so something that kind of you know tickled my curiosity is about his research work on biofuel and sugarcane productivity under stress conditions which is well recognized and is published in three books and 120 research papers Professor Nayak has received Karnataka Academy Young Scientist Award, Deccan Sugar Technologies K P Deshmukh Award, and Karnataka State Government Award. It is so privileged for us to have you, sir, today with us and to listen from you the future about the future ready institution. Welcome, sir, and over to you. Thank you, Sanjana. Uh, I am very thankful to Iwin Karnataka, the CIA Karnataka chapter, for making me to come over here and inviting. vice chancellor of garden city university for this very important seminar uh, education redesigned is a very important goal now and uh, everybody all over the world are looking for the change in fact uh, this is the time which we are uh, uh, impressed or we are under the dominance of a pandemic and that has made uh, more important for educationalist and more particularly to the people who are stakeholders of educational institutions to think what will be the future of higher education what will be the future of the way by which institution should develop 
what will be the future of the young minds which are going to be the important citizens of this uh, planet so with this regard this seminar where you are now talking about uh, future ready skills how the education will be globally important and uh, more particularly our earlier speaker also spoke about gender equality with participation of women in education so uh, i am very happy that uh, uh, the situation which we are today is quite uh, uh, in a way dynamic i can say where educational institution have to look beyond as earlier speaker was saying to really make their presence to contribute as per the outcomes expected by the stakeholders uh, in this particular regard i can this paradigm change needs that the institution should look as uh, as told earlier what is within what is around and also beyond us and that's why the new education policy which has come out with many of such things which are being discussed in our country provides the solutions for all that in fact after the independence of our country our entire aim was to eradicate the illiteracy because that was the main challenge then the expansion of the education many places of the country were not at all having even schools leave, leave the colleges and then the came the important task of equity we wanted everybody to come into the educational system and since last 10 years the entire aim was for excellence we made nac and everything to see that whatever education we give has some quality it helps the young minds to uh, become a very important uh, graduate or post graduate with a good knowledge and now the shift has come where institutions need to change uh, their attitude or their objectives because of the change which has taken place mainly because of the pandemic and also because of the globalization of the education so in this particular regard i can say that we can think of six important criteria where educational institutions need to work out to become ready beyond what we are doing now the first very important thing is infrastructure because as we can see now the methodology of teaching the way by which the students are expecting the teaching should happen all is going to be digital or maybe in the blended mode so we need to look into the way by which we can make our classroom in such a way that they are uh, they are having all sorts of facilities not only in the teaching in the classroom but also our practicals our hands on experiences our uh, uh, library e resources and uh, even with the help of our administrative procedures so even when a student enter till he goes out from the university or educational institutions he need to be made in such a way that everything should move with a very important and very different type of infrastructure and for this different types of learning resources different type of softwares different types of modules we have to incorporate in the entire educational system and that is the need of a our the second very important thing where educational institution need to work out is highly dynamic curriculum which is globally relevant which is relevant as per the need of the stakeholders which has multidisciplinary teaching multidisciplinary research multidisciplinary and flexible outcome so all these things need to be concentrated and the entire effort should be student centric the student is the main stakeholder he needs to be trained in such a way that whatever situation comes or whatever way he is going to develop his curriculum or his career as there as an entrepreneur or as a job holder or he starts wants to have his own research ideas and all those things so a dynamic curriculum as earlier told with joint degrees with credit transfer with the short uh, crash courses or diploma courses collaborative courses with many institutions and organizations and for that a very uh, dynamic curriculum is to be developed where we have to involve industries alumina uh, partners from various other university institutions so this is the second important aspect by which all institutions should be ready to become a very higher education system as per our requirement third very important thing is the facilities for professional development of a student so that they are become the potential human resource for the required industry or or the consumers which are there 
and that's why we need to identify the areas where we need to give which are the emerging areas in science and technology which are emerging areas in engineering which are the emerging areas in social sciences humanities and we have to find out such uh, areas where special training or special certificate courses or emphasis should be given which probably include many areas like ict for example or clean energy healthcare system communication tourism transportation nano science so we have many such areas which we have to obtain uh, with the good research as well as consultation with the industry corporate sector and such areas we have to concentrate and we have to develop facilities in tune with that for the teaching those may be facilities which are provided by the institution or facilities which can generate by the participation of industries industries can develop such centers if we provide the facility in the university itself or university students can do, go there and get those type of facilities that is a very important thing the third a fourth important thing is the collaboration which earlier speakers were also telling now it is a era where the university cannot do or education institution cannot do the things on their own because we have limited resources which are limited expertise but the things are changing beyond our expectations and the science is changing the requirements are being changed technology is being changed what is today is not there tomorrow so in that context it is very important that the institutions which are ready to take these challenges should have very good collaborations with the neighboring institutions with very good universities universities in the foreign countries industries corporate sector and all that and in this particular context i want to tell you we were just talking about industry academy interaction or industry corporate sector interaction now the entire education system is india is governed by four major organizations one the institution itself second government because many of our degrees are are regulated by the government so their role is also important third is the industry and corporate sector and the fourth very important thing is the, are the consumers because our students are going to go to a level where they are going to be even if they are entrepreneur or they have their own ideas to have a startup or innovation and all that so all these four area four stakeholders need to have trust on each other there should be a good collaboration and then only all these things are possible so whatever university activities are being carried let it be board of studies academic council or various governing council and all that people from these stakeholders are very much necessary i am very happy that uh, cia karnataka chapter particularly i win you have taken interest to come to us and make us to participate and speak in fact when i was i was abroad uh, many times i used to visit the universities like michigan university or calgary university and i used to meet the professor they used to tell this particular lab is sponsored by this industry surprisingly one because i was told that i am the person in the biofuel and sugar industry so i used to visit those they were saying this lab is sponsored by reliance i used to surprise they are getting the funds from the universities from abroad why we won't get and the only answer is trust our industry should trust our academia our academia should be, bring that trust and confidence among with the help of the consumers and the way they do it so that is very important and uh, today's uh, seminar or today's webinar will uh, lead a path uh, to such type of trust building amongst us and we will work together in this particular direction unique best practices is my fifth uh, concept because each university or education institution have some identity or uniqueness in their various activities which are co curricular because we want the students to develop all round not only in the education but when they come into the society when they face the uh, challenge they should be having not only the technical skills but their personal skills also and to develop that we have to see that the institution has very good facilities for sports yoga then we should bring them into the into the global issues like climate change women empowerment sustainable development so these things can be done by uh, creating as earlier speaker told a center of excellence interdisciplinary or creating certain finishing schools and that way we should have certain uh, unique practices i'm very glad to say that garden city university has a unique practice of giving awards honoring the best people in the industry best people in the sports best people in the and they come to the our university we honor them by giving some sort of award and by which this particular linkage is being developed so such type of uniqueness need to be developed by institution and uh, finally the sixth important aspect of 
the building uh, the institution and making it beyond what we are expecting today is the faculty and also the leadership so our faculty we have to motivate in such a way that they should develop this type of uh, attitude or aptitude to bring this change unless we make that it is very difficult to make our institution to the level where we are expecting so we should have a dynamic faculty we should encourage the faculty in such a way that they acquire all these skills as rightly told earlier the faculty can go to the industry work there industry people can come to the university and take part in our teaching and that way we can make uh, the faculty which is very important stakeholder of the education institution more dynamic more knowledgeable and more skillful which they can uh, impart impart to the students so these are the things which uh, we have to look into i am sure uh, this particular webinar is a beginning in this direction i wish iwin and icc will come forward uh, come forward for such type of interactions with uh, not only leaders like me but even to the faculty because they are the one who are going to do the difference and the students so with these few words again uh, i thank uh, organizers for giving me an opportunity and i'm sure uh, the change which you are envisaging will happen with this type of efforts which if we make together thank you thank you so much professor nayak and i cannot agree more to you the six pillars that you said the factors which is going to impact the change be it a collaborative uh, dynamic professor collaborative facility the resources or the collaboration from the industry uh, this is all that we need today and it is it is a shout out to tell that you know what is that we need to do for a future ready institution thank you so much it was so pleasure to hear from you thank and you. i must agree right we are in an in a journey to embark change and i i can i can vouch this for ivin karnataka and the leadership pillar we are definitely going to reach out to the faculty we are we are there for the collaboration and that the first step that we are going to take immediately after this session to collaborate with the institutes in karnataka to see what how can ivin karnataka be a differentiator in that space thank you madam that will go a long way thank you so much sir now next uh, the speaker for the day is professor jackpet who is formerly the founding vice chancellor of bar Bangalore City University and presently the visiting professor at National Law School and Indian University. I like the theme that we have today for Professor Jaffet. Our time is now, and that's what is going to conclude. We are here, and if we have to make the change, and this is the time we have to embark on this journey. With that note, Professor Jaffet, I I welcome you to the session. Yelvo namaskara. I am delighted to participate in this uh, very important. Uh, <laughs> discussion <clears throat> organized by the confederation of indian industries and uh, indian uh, women network special thanks to samira for uh, tracking me down and uh, uh, persuading me to participate in this uh, seminar let me uh, share some of my uh, tentative uh, tentative thoughts uh, rather uh, india is already and uh, or will be one of the youngest nations in the world with over 10 crore people in their uh, 20s which means one in every four graduates in the world will be from the higher education uh, indian higher education system as india strives to compete with a globalized economy it needs capable and creative professionals and this can be provided only through quality higher education this is evident when we look at uh, developed economies like us europe singapore and now in now china where the correlation between uh, development and quality higher education is solid reforms uh, in higher education in india is slow especially with uh, limited uh, flexibility for decision making in higher education the main reason for which stems from various governance issues this is why we rarely see desired outcome from universities and colleges these days especially state universities i am not saying that uh, private universities or autonomous institutions are uh, free from these uh, kind of issues we always like to compare all institutions with uh, an iit or iim 
but uh, how many institutions have the autonomy and flexibility of decision making there are more regulations that one's mind can recollect than actual education matter at higher education institutions today in fact i am talking uh, this uh, sharing this based on my own uh, experience having served as founding vice chancellor of bengaluru city university for uh, about four and a half years while policy after policy has highlighted this little has changed on the ground as this is evident from the falling quality standards over the last decade the pandemic as some of uh, my friends uh, also mentioned has also given all of us an opportunity to think beyond the traditional board and chalk students don't need more information or knowledge they need the ability to make sense of information or knowledge that is already available for this uh, serious changes need to be brought into pedagogies as well as evaluation systems as my title suggests time is now to create a conducive academic ecosystem that fosters creativity critical thinking and innovation in teaching and learning and to evolve a robust independent financial model for higher education institutions to ensure they are truly autonomous again i am saying that uh, uh while saying this uh, you know while talking about uh, uh, suggesting financial autonomy i am not really suggesting that uh, state should uh, withdraw itself from funding the uh, funding education it has the state must and shall have the obligation to provide free and uniform education to all its citizens even the states when it funds uh, education institutions i am trying to say i am say trying to suggest that the state must give uh, autonomy to inst these institutions now time is now to bring in governance in par with private sector and also encourage the private sector to actively contribute to funding and management of higher education professor uh, naik uh, uh, you know also clearly mentioned about it in fact uh, while uh, i was uh, vice chancellor i must say that i had the privilege of signing an mou with cii for some reasons it could not take off maybe that was the reason that it had to go through again uh, the various bodies and so on by the time my term got over we have visited the mou that has been signed is still there with us i hope we will be able to give life to that another very important when i talk about the governing uh, uh, issues the university when i say that uh, private we must uh, the private sector also must actively participate in the uh, functioning of the universities or colleges i am saying that govern university governing body members should have more eminent people from industry private and public sectors but more importantly beyond just educationists and academia i have had the very frustrating experience of uh, uh, managing uh, these various bodies which are uh, constituted uh, purely on uh, on the on the basis of uh, political uh, um, leanings in fact uh, what uh, has now been uh, of course already i think uh, the government of india and the government of karnataka particularly have uh, issued guidelines for implementation of new education policy but i am saying that uh, this will not go uh, anyway i mean uh, in the in long term unless we are able to bring about a structural change in the both in the comp you know in the composition and functioning of the universities particularly we have to
think of uh, drastically changing the, the, the composition of these various governing bodies of the universities. We have lost much time to catch up with the academic standards set by the developed world as unlike China, our reforms have been very slow and with the new education policy, although again, there are quite a few contentious issues. It's not uh, something that is um, uh, ready to be implemented. There are certain gray areas, there are certain uh, apprehensions from various stakeholders. These issues have to be democratically addressed and, and a consensus must, must, must be reached. But however, with this, uh, we need to really catch up uh, with this uh, opportunity, especially at a time when US-China trade, particularly when we talk in terms of economy and so on, is at a decline and India is as the cusp of uh, economic growth post-pandemic. India with its uh, billion plus population, businesses across the globe are eyeing on the Indian market and are keen to start local operations. But where will they get qualified, innovative, critical and creative professionals? So for all the stakeholders in higher education, if India envisions to become a five trillion dollars economy, let's bring the chain needed in higher education as the time is now or too late. With these few words, uh, let me once again thank the organizers for this opportunity. And I look forward to listening to the distinguished uh, panelists who will be speaking. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Jaffet. And one thing, you know, that is that probably is very quotable from what you said, right? Uh, our generation next probably don't need more information and knowledge. They probably need the ability to make sense from the knowledge and information that is already available. What a beautiful thing to say, right? And, and that is something we all have to be looking at. I mean, you know, how do we create a generation who has the ability to make sense from, from whatever information they have around, right? With that, before we get into the panel discussion and before I hand it over to Samira to moderate the session, I want to take a minute more to congratulate Dr. Father Victor Logo, not only Father Victor Logo, to the entire fraternity of St. Joseph's College for securing the status of university by the Legislative Council. This is such a proud moment for all of us and especially for the college. Congratulations, for, uh, Father. Uh, it is a remarkable achievement. Uh, the college getting into the university, uncommendable. It is really, really a good achievement, right? Thank now, you. I want to hear from you, what has been that role of education in shaping the key influencer, right? It would be great to hear from you, especially now that you are in that status of moving from college to in, in university. I think your words of wisdom is very relevant for each one of us to listen to. Good evening. Thank you for CII Ivan, and especially Samira for a kind invitation. I shall base my reflections on the following four areas. Accelerating urban intelligence. The fourth industrial revolution heralds a new era in human development, one characterized by extraordinary technological advances coupled with unprecedented investment in how data can drive urban futures. Urban intelligence, new forms of mobility, visual informatics, Governing innovation and new forms of citizenship provide the architecture for the fourth industrial revolution. The future of automated vehicles, for example, might well be a relevant and productive discussion in congested cities such as London or Boston. Developing mobility and transit solutions for Nairobi or Kampala is premised on generating data about the transit patterns of the urban poor. Here, technology in the form of mobile phones has the potential to provide the necessary data and urban knowledge required to inform interventions to address congestion. Significantly, the example shows the potential role of technology to generate science and data on and for cities 
and for data to translate to action. To understand how cities work, to provide an understanding of the opportunities and challenges cities afford to humanity, to inform how we can harness these to transition to more sustainable and just societies. Second, future ready skills. If you ask an adult about the most important information they learned in school or college or university, they likely won't cite a particular battle during the World War II or what goes in the nucleus of a cell. Instead, they will likely to tell you about a skill they developed, a teacher who inspired them, or an overarching lesson they learned. These skills will last long after the historic dates and mitochondria labels are forgotten. They will also outlast all technology, jobs, and daily activities. Here's why we are starting to celebrate future ready skills. We need to work on the following 10 areas for future ready skills. First, creativity. How can we use technology and other tools provided to us to solve problems? Second, collaboration. Why will it always be important to work as a team, even though we have all of these technological advances? Three, critical thinking. In a world of endless information, how can students identify relevant information and discern factual news from fake stories or opinions? Four, people management. How can students lead and inspire each other to do the best job they can? Fifth, emotional intelligence. How can you teach such an abstract concept, which is so important to understanding others? Sixth, service orientation. Why should students care about others and how can we empower them to do so? Seven, negotiation. How can students learn to compromise and still advocate for what they want to need? Eighth, decision making. How can you prepare students to make smart decisions using the information available to them. Nine, cognitive flexibility. How can students learn to communicate with different people and audiences? And why is this important? And last, the 10th, cognitive problem solving. How can students tap into their true potential to solve problems and build tools to achieve their goals? While we can't expect students to be perfect, we can give them the tools to develop these skills so they continue to hone them all their lives. These are lessons they will remember long after they have, they left the classroom, regardless of what their futures hold. Third, global education leadership. Education in the global industry is critical to the economic success of every nation and the personal empowerment of every individual. The demands of education leadership are evolving rapidly in response to changes in the global political, economic, social, and technological environments. Develop critical thinking and research evaluation skills and apply these to develop enhanced key skills in line with the personal and professional development needs. So require practical knowledge in education leadership informed by theory and experience of successful school leaders. Advanced skills in building high performing schools and healthy school cultures. Innovative and entrepreneurial thinking in organizational design, curriculum, instruction, and assessment. Inclusive and collaborative decision-making. Inclusive and collaborative organizational governance. Understanding and implementation of effective management systems for talent development and fiscal planning. And finally, women in education leadership. The percentage of women heads at international schools has increased from 27% to 33%. That growth is attributable to the early female pioneers as well as to many male and female champions who encourage women to seek leadership roles in international schools. There is still more progress to be made. Advanced women educators to in leadership in international schools, as well as to provide important role models to future generations of women leaders. Find ways to continue to build and strengthen positive connections amidst the shared experience of educating and leading. The goal is to continue to host meaningful activities and discussions that will build up this community of women leaders in international schools. For women, the circumstances have generated new opportunities to demonstrate their leadership talent and also presented new challenges, given that the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated 
inequalities related to gender. If we pay attention to all these issues and implement innovative ideas in the realm of education and discern the emerging realities, we can surely revolutionize education and make the millennial generation fully equipped to handle the challenges of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Father Victor Lobo. And once again, congratulations for St. Joseph's College becoming St. Joseph University. Congratulations. With this, we are moving on to the panel discussion, I would say the heart of the session. So let me quickly introduce all the panelists today. A quick round of introduction. Uh, welcome Hina Rai, founder of Talent to International Education. Dr. John Terragan, founder of VA in Education. Uh, Alan Atwison, director of Chaman Bharatiya. Dr. Kain Subramaniam, who is the principal RV College. Dr. Shan Murthy, global president, International Association of Coaching. Shan, I do remember that you are telling we are from the future. So Shan is joining us from Malaysia. Welcome Shan today. Uh, Dr. Nitin Garg, Director IS ISME, Dr. Nasser Khan, who is the Director of Treadworks, CA Sadhya, Director of Jagruti Educational Trust, Alok, who is the Head of Sales for Sibom, Dr. Govind Gowda, who is the Assistant Professor for Mount Carmel College. Now, the moderator for the session, a friend and a great mentor, Samira Fernandez. So I would request you to take it ahead from here. Samira, over to you for the panel discussion, which we all are waiting for. Wonderful and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's session. It's going to be very exciting and I would like to start by talking about education redesigned. Why is it that it's time for us to relook at the education sector as a whole in totality and ensure that we move focus from, you know, uh, or the conventional way of uh, you know, the system of education to something for a brighter tomorrow. And with this, I would like to start by asking Father Victor Lobo itself. Father, you gave us a very insightful, uh, you know, a transformation of this journey of education and, you know, some of the key focus areas that we should look at. But can you tell us, you know, uh, you know, uh, what according to you in your perspective would really be some of the key elements to define a very new stage of progress in this chapter? First of all, education for living and education for life. Education for living is one of the small outcomes of education. That education where we are preparing students for jobs, job markets, industries. But we have to teach more than that, education for life. We should make our students creative and critical thinkers. When you make them creative and critical thinkers, they will adjust with times because they're creative and they, whatever new situations emerge, they will respond to them. Therefore, more than education for living, we need education for life. Wonderful. I think those are great inside shares. And with that, I would like to move over to Professor Subramania, who is also the principal of RV College. You know, uh, Professor uh, Subramania, welcome here. And you know, you're, you're, you're working on implementing the National Education Policy 2020 laid down by the Ministry of Education. Can you quickly outline what are some of the main steps that you have taken to integrate yourself into this new journey? Thank you, Samira, for inviting me here. Uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, I'm sure that uh, my sp uh, previous speakers have already told some things about the new education policy, but I would like to put uh, into three baskets in what all the implementations which are happening. Uh, particularly, I focus on engineering education. Uh, so initially, uh, there are policy decisions. In fact, uh, uh, Karnataka government has already set up a committee. They have submitted the report some of the outcomes have already come and Karnataka wants to be the first state in implementing the new education policy from this year itself. The higher education minister has already told about that. So there are a lot of policy issues regarding uh, how much should be the blended learning, then what are the academic bank of credits, then how much should be the interdisciplinarity, then what are the exit entries policies. So all these things I'm sure are going to come from either the state government, universities and the other bodies then we have to get tuned to that. Uh, that is a bigger task. It may take some more time because this is the first time it is happening and uh, we also don't know while implementing how the things are going to happen. But I always feel these are the higher level. 
but there are other levels which we can already start working with at least in my college i started since last two years working in these areas the first one would be the environmental scanning see first of all our education has been always a inward looking i teach something here a student go to the industry or the society and try to fail solving the problems so let us try to look into the outward looking in the sense that uh, uh, do a scanning of what is uh, uh, for example sustainability goals requirement to the societal level or could be what are the 21st century skills what they expect in the industry or could be what are the requirements of the industry 4.0 and 5.0 and uh, education 4.0 and 5.0 which talks about whole lot of digitalization and blended learning so uh, this would be the one uh, kind of thing which you have to work out even before formulating the syllabus creating the interdisciplinary nature and from the academic side of it uh, most important thing would be all the things may quickly happen but the faculty adaptability the mindset among the faculty the training of the new uh, in the faculty in the newer areas of technology is very important it is not so easy if i start today the technological training on blockchain robotics electric mobilities quantum computing data science artificial intelligence these are all huge areas so i think the my first work should be giving the lot of training for the faculty members then looking into the assessment and evaluation system uh, i am sure that a uh, lot of people in the country are talking about this so how do you move away from this uh, total examination oriented to the assessment system and of course uh, providing a skill based training which is the focus so i feel parallelly these things have to be worked with whatever is within our reach like say environmental scanning and the academic part we can start with we can blend that with the policy which comes from the government it's really wonderful that you have shared both internal and external factors while we talk about that i would like to you know take this discussion far away to international borders and we have with us heena rai who is also the director and founder of talent 2 international education uh, from the united uh, you know from from uae united, united arab emirates heena welcome and can you just tell us you know uh, what according to you you've seen this transformation happen during the pandemic and you know uh, you know you, you are actually recruiting students to study abroad Uh, can you quickly tell us what according to you should be the higher purpose of education and where do you see uh, you know uh, changes during the pandemic in foreign recruitments if you can unmute yourself yeah go ahead yeah. sorry sorry hi samira thank you for having me here um i would like to start with uh, so basically with pandemic happening we've had a lot of changes in terms of studying abroad most students weren't able to go abroad which they had planned to but on the hind side what it did was open up different avenues in terms of for example dubai which was supposed to be a small emirate as a kind of blossom with a lot of international universities uh, basically enabling students especially from india to travel to dubai and have a good international education which was quite unseen for in the past so we used to have very seldom few parents who would send their students for higher education to dubai but now because of the pandemic close to the country a uh, safe environment i think this has kind of excelled in uh, sending students over here for international study with regards to a purpose a higher purpose i would say knowledge creates context and an opportunity would definitely be to learn about the world beyond the one we know this is a stepping stone not just for innovation but being a part of the building of a world that's more important so i think and more tolerant i think we need to educate our new generation that yes education is very important but it's a society that we need to build on so i think my take would be that we need to have the students accept the fact that building a world that's more tolerant is something that we need to look forward to thank you heena we also have with us dr shanmurthy who is the global president international association of coaching from malaysia good evening to you uh, dr shan and absolutely delighted for you to be with us and share your insights on the future of coaching i would like to quickly ask you uh, can you tell us what is the role in this and how does it really help aspiring leaders 
to cut across boundaries and to reach out to brighter horizons. If you could share your views with us, please. Uh, thank you, Samira. You know, a few years back, I was looking at it and I found this Peter Drucker who said that, you know, um, culture is strategy for breakfast. And then, if, and then if we need to focus on culture, then what it should be. Then I looked at some of the research and I said, hey, look, let's empower people. And one of the tools that I found that really, really helps me and some of the projects that we do is coaching. Because to cut across boundaries, to go across the other side, one need to uh, be trusted and be respected. And for that to happen, the focus is not on us, but the focus is on the person that we are serving. And coaching allows for that. So when we continuously practice coaching and research has shown us that trust and respect increases and that makes the right culture for transformation. So I find that coaching is uh, because you know it, it talks about the right mindset, mindset of serving, uh, coaching enables others. And I think the most important thing is that the coaching and one of the distinguished speakers talked about psychological safety. It helps a leader with coaching competencies or coaching masteries helps to create that space for psychological safety for people to speak out, think aloud, to, to share their feeling without being judged. So I'm talking about, you know, from the coaching perspective, a coach is not a mentor, a mentor, is, a coach is not a mentor, a coach is not a facilitator, a coach is not a teacher. It's a completely enabling tool, tool for leaders. Wonderful, Dr. Shan. And with that, I would like to ask uh, Dr. John Tarakan, founder of BIV Education, for your perspective. Uh, Dr. John, uh, John, you're really shaping brighter horizons in creating newer mindsets with students. Can you quickly tell us what are the current gaps in the education system and what is it that you can do to inspire change in the process? Uh, thank you, Samira, and uh, thank you to CI Ivan, and a uh, very good evening to everyone. It's been a very interesting set of discussions, wonderful points coming up. And in the context of the question you just raised, Samira, what we realize is that at the end of the day, what would make a student feel more complete? The first step is actually helping them identify what their true potential is. And that's a huge gap we have in terms of the education system we have today. Because most students and most adults as well, are not too sure about what exactly they are destined to do, what are the areas where they could actually shine, what are the skill sets which they can work on and leverage. And for us, that's a very huge starting point. We help students identify uh, what their true potential is. And once they're able to do it, and that's also something which evolves over a period of time, depending on the outside circumstances. Like for instance, we had COVID, we had a lot of plans which students made, parents made, which had to be altered. So the first step is, enabling them to identify what their core skills are, what their potential is, helping empower them by putting in a structured process which helps them build on those skills. And in this context, what we realized is there's a huge difference between some of the core skills which uh, vary by gender. For example, generally women tend to be more empathic. And going forward in today's digital, digitalized world, as Father Victor Lobo rightly mentioned, you know, we talk about urbanization, we talk about how technology is making a big difference. Because right now, we are seeing people focusing a lot on artificial intelligence. But going forward, what's going to happen is it is these basic human skills of empathizing with people, being able to understand emotional intelligence, social intelligence. These are areas which are going to be tremendous, not just limited by uh, geography, because as they say, geography is now history. And Malcolm Gladwell said the world is flat. But today the world is at our fingertips, you know? So that's one very, very interesting point. Yeah, that's a very valid point that you've raised, you know, keeping the global uh, world in our fingertips. And with that, I would like to move on to uh, Alan Anderson, who is the director of Chaman Bharatiya. Uh, uh, Alan, you know, you have done great strides at Chaman Bharatiya with, uh, you know, a foray into different aspects right from your infrastructure, your facilities, your mode of training, your vision and your values. Uh, can you let us know what quickly defines, you know, what are, what are the deep main factors that defines your vision in taking education forward? Yeah, first I'd like to say that 
I look very much forward to sending my students to all the fantastic universities and colleges we are hearing about today. Um, secondly, I think that um, when uh, German Bartier is a K-12 school, so right now we have from three and a half year olds to, 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 to grade uh, seven. Um, but what we have tried to define is what is important skills for a citizen, uh, an Indian citizen of the future. So we have defined what leadership is. Um, and, and we have three important components, equally important. The first one is um, our leadership pillars. Learning to live, that means knowing yourself, accepting yourself, learning to live together, have empathy for other people, learning to act, not to be afraid, to believe that you can learning to learn and learning to lead. That's the basis of everything we do. And then the 21st century skills, we have talked so much about it today, so I don't need to repeat. And then what I would call uh, new, new academics, because India talked so much about academics, what they normally talk about is preparing for exams. When I talk about new academic uh, academics, it means learning what is important to be a citizen in India. So the sustainable uh, development goals will be an integrated part of everything we do. So Wonderful. build on, 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 on that profile of an Indian citizen of tomorrow, we build our pedagogy and we select our content. And I think that's the most important thing for us. And there are three different components I will uh, mention today because new uh, national education policy is a very good framework in India but the, the work has already uh, only started. We need to empower the schools to make them the deciding factor in implementing new national uh, education policy. Next is empowering teachers to take decision, to plan their own teaching, to know what's best for their children, and finally empower children, uh, empower learners, so that their learning their journey is at the center of everything we do. So when we, you talk about the design of the building, the building is designed for many different learning activities, but that's in short what we're doing. Uh, while, while talking about a very important element of sustainability, I would like to now move focus to Nasser Khan, who is the director of Treadworks. Nasser, welcome. And if you can tell us what, why, according to you, sustainability is so important in your offerings. And you know that if you can just highlight some of the critical areas where the education sector needs to really pay attention to at the moment. Hi, guys. First of all, um, uh, thank you for having me here and uh, I'm honored to be a part of the whole distinguished uh, forum over here. So our main topic today is about sustainability. I think sustainability is the need of the hour. Uh, it's no more about, uh, you know, it's good to have, but it's a must have, uh, you know, moreover, it should be a prerequisite and an important factor for doing businesses with any individual. And there's no better place to start off with as, you know, like educational institutions. We're proud to say that through our journey, we've made sure that our packaging is completely plastic free now. We avoid single use plastic. Uh, we're using recycled materials like recycled polyester, organic cotton, all of these things need to be introduced at at, at educational levels, you know, from kids, people need to understand at, at these levels that uh, climate change is real. You know, day before yesterday, I think the whole world got to know, to see the kind of reports and the devastation that it's going to cause in the future. So these kind of awarenesses are, are really important. So, you know, we are encouraging fabrics like recycled polyester, ocean plastic fabric, organic cotton, hemp, bamboo, alternatives to uh, to, to the run of the mill stuff. So, you know, making sure that sustainability is a part of the, the education system and by, by us providing uniforms, it also becomes a part of their daily life as well, you know. Uh, two other things that we could talk about, obviously, is, is the women empowerment in, in education. Uh, my mom, you know, she's been running a business for almost 20 years. She doesn't have a prior education. My wife works for an MNC, uh, you know, and you see the kind of respect that she gets, all our house help, uh, they run their houses on their income, you know, and, and recently there was another report that said that over the years, India has lost almost about $1.4 trillion uh, because of 
uh, lower female participation in the industry. So I think equal opportunity is the need of the hour along with sustainability. These two are, are some of the bigger things that we need to look at in terms of education. And we provide some sort of awareness and then we are trying to be a part, a, a, a tiny part of the entire industry where we are also trying to create awareness with uh, the kind of products and the kind of services that we do and make sure that the whole education industry sort of moves ahead, you know, and progresses in the whole, so to say, as a whole. So true. And I think well said, uh, Nasser. I would like to move on to Nitin Garg, who is the director of ISME. And welcome, Nitin. I just wanted to ask you, you know, our country is moving to a transition and ISME is really playing a role in creating leaders of tomorrow. Can you also tell us, you know, your perspective of what defines the next level of progress? Thank you, Samira, for inviting. Thank you, CII and IWN. Uh, see when you go through a transition uh, we should first understand why this transition is happening why this education needs to be redesigned and i think i'll cover that because many of the speakers have covered a, a lot of a, of everything else so th there are four or five things which are very different from what was happening 10 years back one is there is going to be reverse migration we used to talk about cities becoming bigger and bigger and bigger because there was no other option for people to earn their livelihood. Now the options are going to be where they can sit in any place and continue to earn their livelihood. So the expectation is of reverse migration. And by the way, each point I'm going to raise has an impact on, uh, on the uh, process of education and how it has to be redesigned. I'll not cover the second part, but I'll just quickly cover the three, four or five points which are really changing in a very big way. One is going to be reverse migration. Second is going to be, of course, people have already talked about, even 10 years back, we did not have a problem of information access and knowledge where it was available on our fingertips. Today, we have it. So obviously, education gets impacted when, when, we, uh, when we have that. The third thing is technology has been there, but the extent with which technology has started to impact our lives especially once technology entered the cell phones and the cell phones become, make, became the medium of transaction, which only happened in the last 10 years, is again something which affects the way we live, the way we earn our livelihood. And as a result, it affects education. The fourth thing is the emergence of micro businesses. We used to talk about businesses being big. And if you are big, only then you will be better. You can, you can kind of compete. Today, probably it's again going to be a reverse thing. It's going to be where smaller businesses perhaps could do better. Uh, individuals could do better. Freelancers could do better. And again, that the, this trend is going to transition. And lastly, of course, um, especially in many societies, including India, I just added this point, is the gender balance is becoming better. Even in terms of uh, ISME per se, we almost have now 50% of the students who are, who are female students. I think it's around 47 to 50%. So the gender balance is certainly becoming better um, over the years. Now, I these are trends, something. and yes. these trends ultimately impact education. And, and, and there are many ways in which they will impact education. But this, whatever, these five points were not there even 10 years back. And these trends are something which we need to watch out for and continue to adapt education. I think a lot of good ideas have already been proposed or already have been talked about. Uh, so I will leave, uh, leave, leave my talk uh, for now with regard to the transition aspects of why well, this transition is happening. Well said, Dr. Nitin. And with that, you know, when you spoke about impact, I would move on to CA Sandhya uh, Nagar, and uh, she's the director of Jagrathi Education Trust. Uh, you know, uh, Sandhya, when we talk about education and its impact, can you tell us, you know, what, what are some of the career opportunities that students should actually look forward to when deciding courses, uh, you know, uh, in reality? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, CIA Iwin, and especially Samira for having me here. Uh, instead of telling, you know, which career is better for whom uh, and things like that, having been in the career guidance platform since past seven years and dealing with them, seeing them go through the process of choosing the careers, one thing that we have realized is most of them do the same mistake of choosing a career or course based on the marks that they have secured 
or peer pressure or even the smallest things like i don't like science let me take up commerce do they really know what commerce is most of the times no having yeah. said that, that that's that, that's the pathetic way of choosing the career and a lifelong decision to be made in such an easy way instead we usually tell them ki you know uh, when you are choosing a, a good chef or an architect we usually look for their quality of work rather than the scores on their mark sheet we prefer them to know their work well rather than having good vocabulary skills to explain their entire skills on the paper that's where we say if a kid is good having good imagining uh, world in a 3d view he can be a better painter or a civil engineer similarly one with musical uh, sense or pitches he can succeed well as a sound engineer one with good articulating things he can do wonders in mass media or in arbitration field and one with good eye, eye and hand coordination can be an amazing fashion designer or even a best heart surgeon so when you really know what is your innate skill what is your innate strength and uh, having the top skill sets known to you very clearly when you choose a career based on that i think your success will not be a you know very difficult thing to achieve wonderful sandhya and with that i think we are running short of time but i would like to quickly pose a question a very relevant question for cii iwn for all of you today i would like to request you to keep your sentence to either a specific point or a sentence and this question will go out to all the panelists starting with alok who is the head of sales of sivam uh, alok Uh, uh, my question is you know what is the role of women in today's society let's talk about education and leadership let's talk about empowerment let's talk about community building or driving societal change what in your view in one point or sentence is our need to focus on and where should we you know stress importance in this area over to you alok thank you samira thank you cii and ivan for having me today so coming straight to your answer uh, samira i i would like to say that 90% of uh, the creative people in our office are uh, women or female so uh, it's not just about the field of the architecture or the physical space or the design but it's also uh, uh, about how uh, creatively their thought processes are uh, the feeling of uh, motherhood love affection care so when we talk about education it's uh, with the knowledge and with the experience and everything it's more about nurturing them and making them uh, able to stand out and uh, uh, like live their life so yeah. as uh, 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 professor nayak mentioned uh, that infrastructure was the first uh, first point in, in his list so my field is uh, mostly related to infrastructure and looking uh, right from uh, the beginning from my past history of 8 years into this field i have seen women doing exceptionally well into this field and delivering uh, the exceptional results thank you alok that's great dr govind Go- gowda is also from mount camel college and bangalore city university what do you dr gowda govind what is the role of women in today's relevant in education uh, good evening ma'am hello i am adivan go ahead yeah yes ma'am can you please repeat uh, because what is the role of women in today's education uh, you know in the industry as a whole in the sector uh, see, since i am in working for a women's college uh, i am seeing that um, most of them are getting jobs but could not able to survive maximum 2 to 3 years i am finding out what is the reasons whether it's a problem in the skills a problem in the curriculum or a problem in the industry side but many of them are saying they could not able to cope up with the industry the pressure not only the pressure the curriculum what we using today and the what technology organizations are using there is a lot of gap between the industry and the organization for that where we are lack we need to find out that especially the universities and the institutions we need to find out the where is the gap for that we need to some analysis we need to do some do some research to find out what's the future they require and what are the opportunities especially for the women of course government is providing lot of opportunities in the startups and make in india program center and even the jobs also they are giving some preferences to the women but where we lack we have to find out and give more 
job oriented courses in the organizations and the institutions that's all. wonderful thank you so much dr govin gauda from mount camel college i would like to go over to father victor lobo again father you know uh, you know you've been in this field for decades together and you know every time i talk to you i can i can genuinely feel you driving women empowerment and supporting the community further very genuinely father uh, where exactly is the gap and what is it that you can do in this area first of all the stereotypes of the pastors should be gone okay. because there's stereotypes in the families stereotypes in the in the society that women cannot cannot do. but women have disproved it and the wherever there are women they proved it much much better and today we see any leadership there are women beautiful go to the space go to the space they are there there are scientists all here there are women that means the stereotypes have been disproved so as science says because scientific truth is always disproving the past to disprove these stereotypes thus women will be empowered and they also take equal leadership positions equal with men well said dr uh, father victor lobo and over to you dr john tarakan what are your views i think when we when we think to women the first thought that comes to mind is our, our moms our teachers people who actually nurtured us in the past and i think what we need to do now is actually nurture the nurturers you know because okay. there's no doubt in anyone's mind that women are capable of doing anything a man can do we just need to Thank change you. our mindsets give them the opportunities and the skills required in a nutshell that's what Hina. i would say thank you kina over to you yeah um as much as we are moving towards a society where women are taking up leadership positions subtly in a very subconscious minds there's one question that i would say is that we are raising daughters more like sons but very few have the courage to raise their sons like daughters and i think this is something very subtly within us as much as however modernized we may be there is always that barrier and that's something that we need to break thank you hina well said dr shan please share your views i like what you said is uh, earlier we need to nurture the nurturers what are the skills and competencies are we providing you know and there are some projects that we did here in the educational institute where we had professors phd holders to coach secondary school students and they expected the professors to actually tutor them because they are professors but the professors were the head of a coach and the result was amazing improvement in their results because making them to think and as far as human leaders are concerned i would like to say that they are natural coaches because they are nurturers and we just and it does not even only in the education sector even in communities we have worked a lot of community in community mothers single mothers giving them the giving them the tools and processes to have coaching conversation to continuously nurture the society true as, as mothers and leaders a wonderful alan if you can share your views yeah we need uh, women in in every area of society because if they are not there we will lose too much talent um and the way we can do it in a, a k to 12 school like mine is by uh, we do three three things that are important um uh, first we uh, every every student will have a personal mentor that will follow them throughout for 12 years with in the start it will be a teacher later on hopefully something someone from uh, the business community we have a thing called passion projects where it's the idea that children every week will do something they are passionate about and they can change them and they will talk to the mentor about why they want to change and then in the end it will turn into career and really? by having these elements i hope that we can give also the women self confidence believe in their passion and follow the passion and know what it takes to do it thank you alan for that and with that i would like to end with a fire uh, you know it's called the rapid fire round so i'm going to you know mention your name and you're going to tell me one word 
one word on what it means. Hope you've all understood the game. Yeah, so I'm going to start by asking Anjali. Education. Inspiring. Hina. Empowerment. Dr. John. Life changing. Dr. Shan. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Purpose. Wonderful. Dr. Victor Lobo. Creative thinking. Sandhya. Path. Path to the success. Dr. Subramania. Dr. Nitin. Living life better. Beautiful. Nasser, are you there? Road to excellence. Sajana. Future. Beautiful. And Alok. Vision. Dr. Govind Gauda. It's a need, a requirement. Beautiful. And I think with that, we sum up, uh, you know, the beauty of education, what it means for us and how we are planning to take it forward. Because, you know, education is not one perspective. It is a collective perspective of great minds and great thought leaders together. And before I end this, I would like to ask Deepa Gagadran. Deepa, tell me what does education mean to you? One word. Freedom of thought. Sorry? Freedom of thought. Great. And Ap Aparna? Oh, lifeblood. Wonderful. And um, uh, I, I think with this, it only shows that perspectives are diverse. And, you know, before we move ahead with incorporating anything, it should always be, uh, you know, a deliberation, discussion with like-minded thought leaders and then shape our world to be a future place. Uh, I, re I thank you all for being a part of this panel. I've enjoyed insights from you all, and I would like to move it on to Anjali to take this forward. Thank you so much, Samira, for putting you know uh, so much of thought and getting so many ideas together in this one room. Um, I can see the polls come up, and I'm sure you know most of you have already put in your thoughts, but on behalf of uh, CIIWN, I would like to take this opportunity to thank each one of you for your valuable insights and the vision, the, um, you know, the sincerity and passion with which you have shared your thoughts and ideas has been truly inspiring. I suppose that's why the word inspiring came in the moment Samira asked me that one word. You know, this, um, it's not just brought in a treasure of knowledge, but in some sense, it has challenged our thinking, our beliefs. And um, that's very significant because as enablers for learning, uh, the new world is inviting us not just to, you know, is actually inviting us to go beyond um, content expertise. It is urging us to tap into not just the emotional or social, but also relational capabilities. So. This session today for us, uh, or this dialogue today, it has in some sense opened new doors. It's a new world of possibilities. We are, you know, it gives us so much to think about and uh, shape meaningful uh, support and uh, serve women leaders in the education space. I also take this opportunity to thank the beautiful collaboration across CIIW and Karnataka pillars in working towards SDG and the stellar leadership that both Nandini and Anupma have been steering this entire conversations, the programs, the initiatives with. Um, would also want to thank each one in this leadership um, pillar, uh, Sajana, Aparna, Samira, Deepa, who have been committed to this journey. And it is going to be a beautiful journey ahead as we come back to you, like Sajana said, to each of the institutes with some thoughts in a way that we can add value to. Uh, sincere thanks to Julin for keeping up and being that support system. And to all of you, a heartfelt thanks to all of you who have joined in today to listen to this fantastic conversation and to many who are going to listen to this post this session. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.
Should the team stay back? Just us from the leadership track. Thank you, Dr. Sean. Thank you, Alan. See you soon. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Namita.